Okay. Uh, so my paper, uh, this is my dissertation topic. It's still um, in progress. Um, is for this presentation, um, I'm presenting um, certain parts. So it's called the um, indigenous identity performance in diaspora. Are you okay? So um, I start with. Okay, so from June to October of um, 1912, there is an Shakespeare's England exhibition which was held in Earl's Court in London. And uh, this was organized by the mother of uh, former Prime Minister uh, Winston Churchill. And uh, the idea behind this exhibition is for them to raise funds to uh, create um, a, a permanent performing uh, theater for the place of Shakespeare. And she also aimed to produce a um, uh, particular uh, playing uh, company that will perform the place of Shakespeare in a, in a permanent theater. Um, however, this exhibition in this exhibition, um, the kind of attendance that was expected for this exhibition, um, the audiences did not arrive, so they were on the verge of um, not recouping the investment that they gave for this exhibition. So for uh, in order for them to uh, increase uh, interest in this exhibition, they added a circus, and in it, it, it is in the circus that a group of uh, Igorots uh, were um, were placed as exhibits along with other um, other groups from other countries, and uh, th this was um, called the Igorote Village. Of course, this is a familiar um, image because uh, I guess you've seen images of this uh, in the U.S. And this group of Igorots are actually part of the group put together by Seinfeld and and Felder, who are uh, American businessmen. Uh, who were in the earlier uh, circuits of exhibitions in the U.S. in 1904 and in the years thereafter. And um, fast forward to 2015 uh, in Hansu, there is another Igrot village, uh, but this time it was put up by contemporary Igrot migrants in the U.K. So this is the Igrot village at that time. And uh, in addition to in addition to the image, the centerpiece of the Great Village is the Banana Rice Terraces. They also had a mini museum where they put all this um, material culture from the Cordillera. And uh, you also have uh, like models of the of the attires of the Cordillera. So you have these ladies in the in the attires. And uh, several days later, there's a Facebook post because the organization holds um, has a Facebook page, and the, there's a post which uh, elaborates the museum which was performed in the Igrot village several days before, and they posted this kind of explanatory uh, post about the attires of of the Cordillera. So there's the male attires as well. So um, my research is about uh, about Igrot UK and its org organizational practices. And I became interested here because, of course, when I came here to study, uh, I became a member of the organization. And I observed all the, the amazing amounts of energy and resources being invested into the organization of several activities here. And I also became part of this organizing these activities. So I wanted to, to look at that. Uh, I will skip the ethnographic um, profile because Dr. Mackey already did that earlier for a brilliant presentation in the interest of time. So I will not go through the ethnographic material. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, this is a growth UK. Um, it says for 20 years, but it's actually more because uh, it, it was funded in 1995. I will also skip the historical and organizational details of growth UK because there's an exhibit uh, outside where we can read the history uh, of the organization, how it began, and the, the officers who are involved in the organization. So what I like to do is to run through the activities that the organization actually holds in London. And um, I'd like to look at these uh, activities um, and, and try to understand why these are being organized and for what purpose these are being organized. What, what are the purposes that they serve for the organization? So there's um, Green Cameo. This is whole. Uh, this is held uh, in order to celebrate the foundation anniversary, the anniversary, founding anniversary of the organization uh, in Growth UK. Then they also have several social events. Like there's a line dancing competition. Uh, there is a folk night. Uh, it's, this is like a simulation of the bars that we are all familiar with if you are courtier. Of course, you've gone to Wild West at uh, one point in your life. Or I think uh, at some point it became Batawa. I think now it's uh, country sounds in Magsaysay. So it's like a simulation of that kind of uh, experience back home. And then there's also the sports competitions uh, among the, the members. There's the trip, the organized group travels to different uh, parts of the UK. This one is Eastbourne. And there's the beauty pageant, um, Miss Igret UK. So you have here the attires as well. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, analyze these uh, activities of the organization from the point of view, a framework of what uh, Mark w um, Watson proposed as um, diasporic indigeneity. Um, we always associate indigeneity. I think uh, Professor Chapramovas was explaining yes, uh, yesterday that the IPRA defined indigeneity in relation to the requirements that you, you, you have to be uh, attached to a territory, for instance. But here, um, we're trying to look at the idea that uh, indigeneity is not necessarily defined in terms of your attachment or dwelling in place, but that it can also be performed um, elsewhere and in the diaspora. Um, diaspora and indigeneity, sometimes they are uh, like op opposite terms because diaspora is dispersion and indigeneity is, is dwelling. So there's some kind of tension in these two two notions, but um, in the idea of diasporic indigeneity, it says this is, this is not so, and it's possible for you to be indigenous while you are in the, uh, while you are in migration. Okay. And of course, this developed, um, in the work of Mark Watson, it, it developed from his work with the Ainu in Japan. But his work, of course, developed from earlier ideas of um, of uh, that showed uh, new processes and practices among indigenous peoples in order to transform and survive, especially in the modern world and in the new circumstances of their uh, of their uh, dwelling. For instance, now indigenous peoples are living in urban areas, and indigenous peoples are actually migrating to uh, overseas destinations. So uh, this is just a some of the few scholars who are uh, engaged in this. So there's indigenous modern by Moek, uh, based on his work in Australia. And then in the indigenization of modernity by Marshall Salins, uh, based on his work in the Pacific. And uh, indigenous articulations by uh, James Clifford. Okay, so what this uh, framework tells us is that um, being a diasporic group or, or a diasporic formation is not actually something that is given. Like you, you are not in um, just because your parents are, for example. Some people actually say Igorots ang parents ko, ganon. Sabi or tagasagada ang parents ko, but I'm not maybe. So what I'm trying to point out is that we perform um, our indigeneity and it doesn't come with us when we move, so it has to be mobilized. And um, therefore, 
I chose to study an organization because when you have an organization, I suppose there is uh, there is mobilization because you organize as 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 groups and you're not working as individuals. So I'd like to uh, look at the. Uh, the activities in relation to certain practices that are being made by the organization. And among this is the performance of rituals, this particular rituals when they do Grand Canyon or the other um, events, cultural events in London. So uh, if you look at these images, for instance, you'd notice that there's some element of um, improvisation. Because, for instance, if you look at the the animals which are made of crafts, you know the 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 animals are made of paper, and it's very interesting that when these uh, events are performed, um, some of the members actually take a day off just to make the imitation pigs, the imitation cows, and um, it's very interesting that they invest so much energy and resource and and willingness to to not own for that day just to produce these materials. And you also see um, a kind of the improvisation that we see in relation to the materials that are required for the ritual, for instance. Some of them um, were actually sent from home, like the jar. This was actually used uh, in a ritual at home, for instance. But also, they improvise on the other materials. So there's like this mixture of improvisation and attempt for authenticity because you sent the materials from home. So uh, in trying to understand why this is being performed, um, I think of it in relation to memories, um, in, in relation to rituals. And um, I'm trying to understand that in relation to Holbach's idea of collective frameworks of memory in which um, it doesn't really... Um, the instance of the ritual performance is an instance in which the group is able to uh, reconstruct um, collectively according to what they remember in relation to their rituals from home. And that um, this ritual shouldn't be read in relation to a discourse of is it an authentic ritual? Uh, is it something that um, that actually um, represents what is being done at home, but I'm trying to understand this as the site in order for the members to collectively remember what is, and the remembrance is actually the instance of them coming together in this particular events that they hold in, in London. There's also uh, in, the, in the events that they hold this particular kind of uh, repetitiveness in terms of bodily movements, like for instance, this uh, Bandian dance, for instance, or that you have the performances of the Kalinga group, then the Ifuga group, etc. So when you attend all the, the these cultural events, you notice a certain kind of repetition, repetition of the body movements and body comportment and the attires. So I'm trying to read this in relation to um, the identity of the individual, of the group, in relation to um, the, repet uh, the repetitive quality of all these bodily movements or bod bodily discipline actually creates the idea that this is, this is our identity. This is what makes us a, a community. And I'm trying to understand this in relation to maybe Judith Butler's idea of performativity, where uh, in terms of gender, I think um, the gender discussion earlier is informative, in which we perform our gender, we, became, we become woman or man, not because we are born, but because we perform all the requirements of being a woman. So uh, we also perform our, uh, our identity as egress. For example, I am... I need to perform my great identity by having to wear this skirt when I'm uh, presenting my paper as a uh, part of, of that kind of performance, for instance. 
In the next set of slides, I'm going to look at um, visual productions. I'm going to look at the signifying practices that are being done by the organization. And I'm looking at this through the uh, through the social semiotics. So, Social semiotics is, is the tool which I'm, I'm using. It, it means that you know, it's it's a way to unpack the visual materials which are created by the organization uh, by looking at, looking at the elements of the the images. And most of the images that I'm going to look at are posted in the Facebook group of the organization. So I'm trying to. Uh, um, look at what these um, particular visual productions actually are communicating by looking at the elements that that are there. So for example, this one, like I said earlier, um, there's the organized groups, group travels to different places in the UK. So, of course, uh, unmistakably, that's Stonehenge. Um, and that's Madame Tussauds with the royal family. Then you also have Edinburgh, um, Carlton Hill, and I think this near Hollywood House Palace. So in looking at these images which are posted uh, in the Facebook page, there are several interesting things which I think we need to point out. Uh, for instance, why, uh, why would you wear your, your ethnic attire uh, in these photographs? And it's very interesting that in these travels, th there's an effort to bring the attires with them. And uh, if you notice the trip in Edinburgh, for instance, it was rainy and cold, but there's an effort to change into the into the G-strings just for this photograph. Um, it's just interesting to look at this one. And uh, I'm, in looking at this one, I couldn't help but compare uh, or think about uh, the photographs in terms of the tourism model in which when we travel, we actually wear the the attires of the people in the places that where we travel. So for instance, if you go to Scotland, you're going to wear the Scottish attire in order for you to have a, an experience of authentic experience in the Scottish culture. So when tourists go to Bargy, they, they actually also wear, if you go to Burnham Park, you wear the tapis and the headdresses in order for you to uh, take a photograph. You go to Banana, it's the same thing. So um, I'm trying to make a connection between, is there a connection between this touristic practice and all this uh, this um, practice in uh, among the great migrants in the UK? And I'm, and I'm making the connection that um, it seems to me like the functioning of these images is to say that um, we made it here, you know, the Igrets have come to Stonehenge and uh, they came to, to Edinburgh, etc. So there's this kind of framing of the narrative in terms of mobility. Um, we are able to uh, move around the, the country of destination. And this is very interesting in relation to, for instance, uh, irregular migrants, um, because the kind of mobility that is being produced in these images seems to me like it is an it is an effort or attempt to kind of uh, kind of produce a mobility that they don't actually have because they are irregular migrants. And if you're an irregular migrant, you're always on the lookout. You cannot. You're immobilized in a way because you're always uh, worrying if you're going to be uh, picked up by the by great border force, etc. So this this kind of mobility that's being um, created in the, in these narratives of these photographs, I think, is a way to uh, manage that kind of uh, kind of this juncture in the immigrate immigration to manage that kind of insecurity in terms of not being able to move because of your uh, immigration status. And uh, Dr. Lockin um, discussed something in, in her book, um, Archipelago of, of Care, in relation to um, trying to hide in plain sight. And her explanation is, of course, she, ex she can explain this better <laughs> to paraphrase what she said. Um, you are trying to do uh, what the regular 
migrants actually doing order for you not to be singled out as hiding. So you become regular by way of you also doing what the regular members are doing. And what are the regular members doing? They're actually traveling in this in this attire. So it's a way of trying to create a visibility for yourself um, despite your invisibility because you because of your uh, maybe immigration status. So it's, it's a way of like reshaping your condition as um, an irregular into somebody who's actually there visible. And your friends and family members who are looking at your photographs say, hey, she made it to the UK and she's traveling. She's having this um, kind of glamorous life. And um, it's not only for you as an individual, you're actually carrying the identity of your own people. So you're not representing yourself as by yourself, for instance, but saying that um, this is not just me as an individual traveler, this, this is us. And if you, I looked at the comments in the exchanges, uh, under the Facebook exchanges in the comments, and the people at home or egrets elsewhere will actually say, yeah, it looks like we all also traveled with you, as if we're all also there with you. So it seems like everyone uh, became mobile through this uh, practice of this migrants in London. Okay, and then another interesting practice is um, when the organization, um, when the organization um, organize their their cultural events. They usually, it's through Facebook that they communicate in relation to the logistics of the of the events because of course they're dispersed uh, across London so there is, it's not easy to congregate to plan the activities. So it's usually through Facebook that they do that. And um, one of the genre of visual materials that they uh, produce is the invitations. So I look at this genre of um, visual material in the Facebook post in relation to, again, what kind of narrative are they trying to produce um, uh, in relation to their community. So, uh, of course, you're familiar with this the local transport of Dawa, Trump. Uh, and the um, GL trans for people in the mountain province. And then you have uh, the jeep from Lubuaga. And uh, the rising sun for uh, Bonto. Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at this uh, invitations uh, posted online, there are several things that we can say in relation to what they're trying to say. So looking at the elements, for instance, um, by using the, the images of, of travel, like the bars and jeepney, again, we are looking at the narrative of mobility. And uh, if you look at the the image of the jeep from the blog, and there's um, uh, an almost a kind of very subversive quality in relation to um, the, the very strict travel regulations in the UK. Like, you, know, you cannot do a top load when you arrive um, in London, but hey, they arrive in this particular jeep. And um, I'm trying to, to analyze this in relation to uh, like a vernacular Attacking of the of the landscape of the country uh, of destination, and um, also uh, this kind of this kind of uh, image was produced for a particular event, which was a Grand Canyon, which is the celebration of the founding anniversary of Igorot UK. So, in that particular context, it means that the people who arrive in these buses came to attend. The, the event. The <laughs> yeah, so they arrive in this kind of very uh, local fashion because of the local transport. And I'm also looking at the local transport in relation to uh, the kind of, when you, when you go in the Korea, right, these are the means of travel. And so you always associate this with the memories of the travels that you made when you were in the Cordillera and all those, those kinds of memories that you have in relation to the Dangwa bus. Or, uh, in the UP bag, you always associate um, the, the kind of travel when doing research, uh, the kind of transport that you have. So again, this, this, uh, these images, they reinforce that idea of a particular kind of desire for mobility. 
And uh, again, I'm trying to analyze that in relation to the kind of it affords the mobility for, let's say again, irregular migrants who are not able to manage this kind of mobility and uh, who will always try to hide uh, when there are a border force in tube stations or in particular uh, places. So that there's always a warning, you know, um, there's a border police in this particular station, so try to avoid and go elsewhere, etc. Okay. Um, there's one set. There's one set of these invitations which I failed to in include here, and they actually show the route master, the red bus, and the black cab going to the Cordillera. <laughs> so this, this is a background of the Banaro Rice Terraces. This is a background of the Benguet Capital. And so you see the reverse of this set of invitations. What you see is like the migrants here. They actually sent. The, the means of travel from London to fetch the participants from the Cordillera to bring them over here in London to attend the Grand Canyon. So what, what are we seeing in the interaction of these images? I'm trying to suggest that this is like a collab collaborative fiction, you know, like a creation of, uh, of a common aspiration of mobility, of a coming together um, and it's a fiction because, of course, it's not quite possible. But in the in the uh, space of Facebook and in the space of the manipulated images of afforded by di digital media and uh, manipulation applications, this kind of aspiration is possible. And so I'm trying to analyze this in relation to a particular kind of symbolic rehoming strategy for these uh, migrants and they are able to manage all the kind of learning for home, especially for instance if you cannot go home because you're irregular and you cannot you cannot do this kinds of um, mobility all the time. Okay, so uh, on the other hand, I'm also looking at this as um, although it means a particular kind of, of picture of, of uh, mobility, there's Somehow there's some problem into it that you can see in relation to, uh, of course, the arrival of the great migrants in London was not as fashionable as arriving in an overloaded jeep because some of the migrants actually arrived not through Heathrow but actually in a circular fashion. Some of them came through Hong Kong and through Singapore, through the Middle East. So it's not a kind of very straightforward, a happy story of arrival. So the, the kind of story is not being told here, of course. It's it's been hidden. But this kind of stories, which are pretty painful, and um, the members here are trying to manage, is being... Um, it's in, they are able to manage that kind of situation by, you know, by invoking these kinds of uh, visual productions, which we see here. Okay, so in my project, I'm trying to suggest a sort of a kind of <laughs> reconstructive indigeneity, and this is the kind of uh, concept that I'm trying to build. So the idea of reconstructive indigeneity um, uh, operates uh, one in relation to if you if you look at the Igret village that I showed earlier, there's an attempt uh, among the members to actually engage in colonial history, to actually say uh, to produce a, a sort of counter discourse, saying you know we're not that Igret uh, who were exhibited in the Shakespeare's Indian exhibition in 1912. We have. Uh, we are these people, we, we have a vibrant culture and it's um, composed of all this um, material culture and, and although we have differences uh, according to provincial organizations or ethnic groupings, we are, um, we have, we are a community. Um, and also, when you look at the photographs uh, about the travel where they wear the attires, there's some sort of counter attempt for a counter discourse also. Because indigenous peoples like Igros are always associated as uh, living in far flung areas, you know, like um, beyond civilization. So, uh, 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 many. Um, Mainstream Filipinos would actually say, would be surprised to know that there are egrets in London. Uh, so um, 
this kind of discourse is saying, no, we're not relegated to this 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 far-flung areas and we are uncivilized or savages. They actually come to London and uh, see they even interacted with the royal family, for instance. <laughs> or we've traveled to all these places uh, and we're going places. Uh, so that's the kind of reconstructive purpose that I'm trying to argue. And it's also reconstructive in a sense that, uh, like I explained earlier, it's reconstructive because it's giving the, the, the members of the organization a way of community building. So it's reconstituting the community. So there's a space of belonging in which they can grow as an individual. And um, I have <laughs> and I have observed that uh, a lot of the a lot of the members who uh, a lot of the members actually have taken this as a vocation to actually pr produce knowledge about the ingrot, to produce images about the ingrot, and I'm thinking that this is their way of managing the sorts of insecurities that, that they experience. For instance, what Russell Par uh, Perinius describes as contradictory social mobility, you know, uh, a lot of the members are professionals, they're middle class, and then they come here and they are employed in, in low paying jobs, for instance, so it's contradictory because you, you have higher earnings, but you have a lower prestige kind of job. So how do you manage that? Uh, I'm suggesting that they're trying to manage that in this reconstructive way by by engaging in uh, cultural performance. Thank you. <laughs> Um, is there a difference between the performativity of the global Igorot diaspora vis-a-vis -vis the local diaspora? Because you can also find uh, Igorot communities all over the Philippines. And some of the most fun Grand Canals I've attended have been outside the Cordillera. For example, uh, we have a fun memory of attending an uh, Ifakal wedding in Bukidnon, mm -hmm. where there was a dance-off between uh, the Igorot dancers and the Talandig in that community. Uh, but I do wonder, is there a difference, or is it the same? Uh, okay. I think maybe the difference in relation to the to the performance of growth identity in like overseas destinations like UK is uh, that there is an interaction of of the migrants in relation to the UK situations. For instance. Uh, for instance, you have the structure that supports the the um, the idea of uh, in international interaction with, let's say, the Igorots in Europe. There's also uh, diaspora communities in European countries. So the interaction between UK and uh, in Austria, Switzerland, etc. They, I think, they have. Um, I don't want to say, but sort of more cosmopolitan <laughs> sort of thing in relation to the performances uh, and because they have access to, they have the structure to access all sorts of uh, ways to represent themselves, they have more varied ways of, of, of signifying practices to accomplish these kinds of uh, representation, self-representations, as opposed to, uh, I'm not sure, I didn't really look at the literature about the performances, like, internal in the Philippines, so I cannot make a very good comparison. Okay. The global organization, the IGO, is the yes. What I'm wondering is, in London, if you have a group that calls themselves Igoro, but there are people who maybe who do not want to be recognized or identified as English. So is that organization here in London that you're studying, are they uh, from all over the Cordillera or just exclusively Ibaloi? No, um, the migrants, I should have uh, presented, of course, the composition of the group, uh, but the organization is composed of members coming from all the provinces uh, of the Cordillera. So the, the organization is actually, it's, it's like a centralized, it's like the mother, they call it the mother organization of 
provincial self-regulating organizations like a federal kind of governance. Um, and yes, they're all coming from the provinces of the Cordillera, except maybe Abra. Um, we don't have yet a part of the mother organization, although I think some, of, some individuals coming from these provinces are also approaching the organization to join. And also the, the organization, they have what they call the sister organizations, like uh, sister organizations because these are um, from the provinces which are in the, in the neighboring provinces of the Cordillera, like Nueva Vizcaya. And of course, the people there trace their roots from the Cordillera, so they, they become part of the organization. And in relation to uh, what if other people don't want to be called Igorot, for instance. So I'm using the, of course, I'm aware of the kind of politics in relation to the term Igorot. Other people don't want to be called that. But this is the name that is being used by the organization. They name the organization using this name. So I think there, there have been um, discussions in relation to what the organization should be called and what should we call ourselves. But I think the, the discussion there is, is that uh, why sh should we abandon the, the term Igorot when in fact this is a history in which we have the 1912 uh, London exhibition and they're called Igorot and the, the kind of counter discourse that you're trying to attempt is to engage that kind of colonial history. So if you abandon the word Igorot for instance, then how can you engage in that kind of history of imaging the Igorot from those colonial events in the, in the early 20th century. So they, they choose to, to name their organization Igorot and to identify that they are Igorots. Of course, in my, in my uh, um, encounters and attendance with the events of the organization, there have been a lot of tensions in relation to to uh, these identifications. Of course, I'm not saying that the organization is a unified, you know, homogeneous group and they're all united and happy with each other. No, that's not the case. Of course, there's a lot of differences, which is quite normal for any, any other organization. But there's always an attempt to manage these kinds of differences. And the kind of management in relation to these kinds of differences is very interesting. Um, and the, the feeling of in order for them to manage this is the idea of a is in, is in in the idea of a family. You know the filial terms in, in relation to, of course we have differences. We have Benguet or the Mountain Province, and you have differences, for instance. But we all come from this place of the Cordillera, and so we have common beliefs, we have common experiences. So this kind of filial relation is invoked, and I think it's reinforced by the fact that the members call each other in filial terms as well, like and the name of the organization, uh, Igorot UK, and its provincial organizations, Igorot UK is called the mother organization, so this kind of uh, very consistent filial description of the organization is trying to manage the differences uh, inside the organization. Of course, a family, there's always, you know, our own families, there's always a dysfunction in our families, but we try to, to manage these differences to move forward.